I think Usha, uh, Sham and Rakesh will probably be starting quickly because it's closing in on four. Yeah. And I don't think anybody would like to, you know, overshoot and wait on a Sunday. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, you're all spending your Sunday with work as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. so just excuse me for a minute, Dennis, and I'll be back. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to everyone. Can we start? Hello. Am I audible now? Yeah. We can hear you. Yes. Excellent. Okay, thank you. I had the same problem a couple of days ago. Hi, Dr. Mukherjee. I'm Usha Ayagari. I am an endocrinologist in Chennai. Namaste, Dr. Sahai. How are you? Namaste. namaste. How are you? Doing nice well, you. thank you. Yeah. Nice again. So, I am doing part two of the meeting, Dr. Mukherjee. And I have broad, I have five cases, but three case scenarios. I have the first two cases are essentially unrecognized premature ovarian insufficiency. Um, the second two cases are um, iatrogenic menopause because of uh, um, oophorectomies at the age of 45 to 46. And then the final case is a classic menopause with uh, vasomotor uh, symptoms. So that we get to discuss, I think, the spectrum. And what I've done is I've done one slide on the case followed by a slide of questions to say in this case, kind of a scenario, what is the best combination? What is the best preparation? Women with uterus, women without uterus, women with vaginal symptoms, would you use topical? Do we go? So a variety of scenarios so that we cover a uh, variety of things. Um, so I was wondering, um, Dr. Meeta, are you going to take questions after Dr. Mukherjee's talk or after the case presentations? Yeah, Usha, so I would leave it to the organizers, uh, uh, Rakesh and uh, uh, Sham, as to okay. what they have to do. So if, but I think probably it would make sense. Uh, I don't know how Dr. Mukherjee is placed, if she's going to stay back till the end of the uh, um, session, then perhaps, you know, clubbing both of them together and finishing it off would be... Uh, oh, no, no, no. Dr. Mukherjee is essential to my session because it's all a sort of <laughs> Q&A between me, you, and you, Dr. Meeta, in fact, because I'm all I'm doing is presenting some cases and putting the questions to all of you to um, educate all of us. Yeah, no, that will actually, actually... No, Dr. Mukherjee, no my session. 
<laughs> if it is, uh, I mean, my opinion probably would be to do it at the end, you know, so you put everything together and then uh, finish it off rather than breaking it. Then, you know, you won't be able to control the time and the question and answers. Uh, yeah, okay, that's my, obviously my, my answer is already answered for me. So <laughs> I'm staying then. <laughs> yeah. You have no choice, Dr. Mukherjee. I have no choice. <laughs> yeah. Rakesh, you're on mute. Hello. Hello, very good afternoon. You're still on. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. So I think we'll uh, uh, soon start <laughs> off and uh, we can then have the presentation by Dr. Anis Mukherjee and then we can, then we can uh, probably have the cases and all of us can be part of the panel discussion in there. So shall we start? Now? If you're okay, if uh, everything is set, we can start. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so do you want me to go ahead myself starting or are you, do you want me to share my screen now? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, do, we ha do we have a uh, audience link separate, uh, Sham? Uh, no, no, I think uh, we kept it very small program uh, for, for a couple of hours. Uh, let me introduce uh, Anis, Anis and myself, we worked together in Salford Royal. Uh, she, she, I used to sit in, in our clinics in chronic fatigue uh, syndrome clinics. I don't know if you're still doing that, but something which we never understood. Fatigue is such a common symptom. And uh, you, you took up that, uh, uh, you know, and then uh, suddenly I found her uh, about the book she has written, uh, yeah. Menopause. So, uh, me and Lusha were discussing a few minutes ago. It's completely neglected area in India. So uh, we are grateful. Yeah, it's completely ignored. Uh, so we are grateful that you are, uh, uh, you know, you, uh, you agreed to give this talk. Uh, by the way, this book, is it available everywhere? Is it only... Uh... I think, Sham, I think it's going to be available in India. Here it is. Um, it, it is going to be available, but it's only just been released in um, the UK. So I think it might be uh, sometime later this month or next month that it's going to be released. Can I just check, are you going to put everybody on silent when I do the talk so that there isn't interference when people come in and out? Is that, is, can you do that? Yeah. Okay, good. Great. Okay. So uh, let me introduce the other. Um... I'm Doctor. I, I'll, I'll just uh, take a minute to introduce the uh, the chairs uh, who are um, and uh, for the program and Doctor Usha also. So Doctor um, Mita is uh, uh, a past president of the Indian Menopause Society, and she is uh, uh. of the Journal of Midlife Health. Uh, which is uh, the official publication of the Indian Menopause Society. And uh, she's been very active in this area of menopause. And uh, so we have a great pleasure in having her uh, today with us uh, in this program. She's associated with Kanvir Hospital in Hyderabad. And uh, we have Dr. Uh, K. Nilaveni, who is Professor of Endocrinology. Uh, she is uh, Professor of Endocrinology at Dusmania Medical College and Dusmania General Hospital in Hyderabad. And uh, she's been very actively involved uh, with the idea clinics and then we have with us uh, uh, and my, myself i'm dr rakesh Sai. i'm professor of endocrinology at usmania medical college and usmania general hospital uh, we all we are, the other speaker that we have with us today is dr usha Yigari, who's uh, at uh, chennai who's a leading endocrinologist at chennai and she's associated with the apollo hospitals and and uh, she has her own uh, 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 practice in chennai and uh, she's associated with many other hospitals in Chennai. So um, with this brief introduction, I would request Dr. Anis to go on with her presentation. Thank you very much. Um, right, so hopefully everybody can see this talk and hear me okay. Uh, wave or let me know if you can't hear. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to give this talk on um, uh, endocrine the endocrine perspective on menopause and menopause hormone therapy. Through the talk, I will use the term menopause hormone therapy interchangeably with hormone replacement therapy, which is um, more commonly used as a term in the UK. So I kind of just 
can't help but say it. There's a little bit of background interference, so I don't know if um, everyone's on silent, yeah. Okay, so um, I think it's important for me to start the talk by uh, really expressing and emphasizing that menopause today, everywhere, is different. And that's because our world has undergone a paradigm shift, a fundamental change in the way the world is essentially compared to previous generations. And that is, you know, as much, if not more so applicable to women who are going into menopause. Um, this group of women today are often described as the sandwich generation. Some of you may have heard the term. Um, they're having, they may be having their kids later or more kids later. Um, they, because life expectancy has increased, and I note that in India, life expectancy has increased by 11 years since 1990, so we're living longer. Women going into menopause may have care roles for elderly relatives more than ever before, um, and they themselves can expect to have more adult life after menopause than before it because of, because of increases in life expectancy. So menopause matters more than ever before. Um, I know in, in the UK, um, men, women in the menopause are the fastest growing demographic in the workplace, and I note that it's less so in India, but there are targets to increase women's labour force participation, and I think it's been estimated that increasing women's labour force participation in India by 10% could add billions to India's GDP, even by 2025, so... This, this is something that I think will be, will be pushed for, and I think it's important. Um, the other point to note today, and I'm going to talk about this in detail, is that safety data relating to hormone therapy, hormone replacement therapy in the menopause, now that the information we have allows better personalization of care and precision medicine. So we can make sure that women are given HRT safely. Whereas even 10 or 20 years ago, there was a lot of fear around the types of HRT and the doses given. So I'm gonna talk about what we understand today uh, later on in the talk. Okay, so let me just provide some menopause facts. So in the UK, the average age of onset of menopause is 51, but it's actually younger in India. So women are going into menopause at a younger age, on average 46 years. And in, um, in the UK, uh, uh, premature ovarian insufficiency, which is classed as um, menopause occurring before the age of 40. In the UK, it's only 1%. In India, it's 5%. So in other countries, and yet, as I've been told, um, there is a less focus on managing menopause in India than in many other Western countries. So it's thought that about 80% of women um, suffer from symptoms, that's based on various international data, and symptoms can occur before menopause is biochemically evident. So we talk often about the perimenopause when women may be having fairly regular menstruation, but they may have marked symptoms. And it's also important to note that for most women, symptoms do spontaneously gradually improve over a number of years. It may be somewhere between two and 10 years. For most women, it's between two and five years and the symptoms gradually settle down. So what are the symptoms? Well, by the way, this is an English woman uh, in menopause, just for your reference. Um, so there are many symptoms of menopause. Uh, menstrual irregularity indicates failing ovulation. That's the one that most women would identify with, along with the vasomotor symptoms, the hot flashes or flushes and the night sweats. And many women will experience those symptoms to some degree, uh, but some uh, more than others and it's a very individual experience but beyond that there are many many symptoms from sleep disturbance to mood changes to joint aches physical changes weight changes um, urogenital uh, symptoms um, there are a very wide array of symptoms and every woman will experience uh, menopause differently today so when I look at managing my patients with menopause, my aims are to support a woman to choose her own informed menopause management path without judgment, to reduce the impact of symptoms and boost her well-being, uh, 
and to maximize any health benefits of treatment whilst minimizing risks. So now I'm going to start with a case. Now I know we are going to do some cases later, but this is just a very, very uh, simple slide about a case just to illustrate um, various factors around treatment. So uh, Jenny is a 48 year old police officer who um, presented originally with quite severe menopausal symptoms. She'd experienced, um, okay. she'd had a, she'd had uterine fibroids and had a, a total abdominal hysterectomy about three years prior to presentation. But her symptoms had got worse. She had ovaries in situ, but she'd become more menopausal in terms of symptoms and they'd really crescendoed. And she now, uh, this presentation felt so bad. She, could, she felt she couldn't work. She thought she was going to lose her job and she couldn't afford to be unemployed. She had no previous illnesses and her GP, she'd seen her GP and uh, the GP had offered no treatment and said the symptoms will settle in time. Now, as the audience includes gynecologists and endocrinologists, you may think, and possibly some GPs, you may say, well, why did the GP offer no treatment when the symptoms were so severe? And so I'm going to talk about why that GP suggested no treatment, because it's not because they were had any bad intentions, but it was basically because of the data that the GP was aware of made the GP concerned about giving treatment. And I want to go into detail about what treatment we could safely offer this woman to get her life back on track and to ensure she can continue in her employment. So the basic reason why the GP said uh, don't have HRT was based on two major studies, which I'm sure you'll all be aware of all too much so. Um, that were published in the early 2000s. So this is nearly two decades ago. So the Women's Health Initiative study from the NIH in America, the United States was published initially in 2002 in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And the earliest data from the Million Women study in Oxford was published the following year. Um, and these studies were launched in the 1990s, studying the effects of hormone therapy on healthy postmenopausal women, uh, between the ages of 50 and 79, the Women's Health Initiative was a placebo controlled trial and the Millions Women, Million Women study was um, uh, uh, an epidemiological trial. And the early pooled results from the NIH study, the, the Women's Health Initiative study, showed that risk of breast cancer and vascular events exceeded predetermined limits of safety. Um, and subsequent results from the Million Women study in the UK showed similar safety concerns. And the early publication of these studies and the media, intense media uh, interest on these studies uh, really resulted in significant changes in practice. Um, it should be noted at this point that even in those early studies, all cause mortality with HRT did not appear to be affected and benefits of HRT or menopausal hormone therapy were demonstrated at that early stage, including prevention of osteoporotic fracture, which is still very clearly a benefit of HRT hormone therapy, and also probably a reduction in colon cancer risk. But the risks that were identified by these studies were an excess in breast cancer diagnoses, thromboembolic phenomenon, uh, atherogenic heart disease, um, stroke, gallbladder disease, and migraines. So after the Women's Health Initiative study publication in 2002, the number of women using hormone therapy for menopause fell by almost 50%. Now that was nearly 20 years ago, so I just want to fast forward really and talk about all the subgroup analysis because this has changed our understanding but a lot of doctors who don't specialize in women's health and menopause aren't aware of the subgroup analysis data which makes really the risks much clearer and identifying patients who can take hormone therapy safely is easier to do today than ever before. So the risks over the first decade after publication um, Publication after publication demonstrated that the risk was higher in older women, and in particular in women over the age of 60, and in women who were treated with much longer durations of treatment, so 5 plus 10, 10 plus 15 plus years. And those women in their 70s, of whom there were many in, the, in these studies, um, had the very highest risk. 
It was also demonstrated that synthetic progestogens may increase cardiovascular and cancer risk, particularly through androgenic and glucocorticoid activity. And in the uh, Women's Health Initiative study, um, the predominant uh, hormone therapy that was used was um, conjugated equine estrogens and medroxyprogesterone acetate. So a very synthetic um, uh, estrogen from pregnant mare's urine derived and medroxyprogesterone acetate is probably one of the most synthetic um, glucocorticoid um, progestogens. So it wasn't surprising that using those preparations, in retrospect certainly, it wasn't surprising that they may have scatter effect on risk um, and with a longer duration in particular. So the subgroup analysis also showed, uh, which is, was no surprise really, because we have experience of this with um, the combined oral contraceptive pill, that oral estradiol increases risk of venous thromboembolism and also gallbladder disease and possibly stroke. Um, oral estrogen does this in the pill. It does it to a lesser extent with uh, menopause hormone therapy because the doses of estrogen used are lower. Uh, and... It, it was quite clear from all the subgroup analysis that transdermal estrogen does not increase risk of venous thromboembolism. And those data are now nearly 20 years on um, transdermal, any, any form of transdermal estrogen, so patch, gel, spray, doesn't appear to increase background thromboembolic risk. Um, also, it, from the um, Million Women study, uh, it was persistently shown that estrogen only hormone therapy so this is estrogen only can be given in women who've had a, a hysterectomy who, who have no uterus and um, when, when that can be given there appeared to be no strong evidence of any increased risk of breast cancer unlike combined HRT and in fact many of the subgroup analysis studies from the, from the uh, Women's Health Initiative in, in the United States actually suggested a reduced risk of breast cancer diagnosis with estrogen only HRT. And I'm going to decode that in subsequent slides because we have more data in the last few years. Um, overall, after the first decade after the Women's Health Initiative and Million Women studies were published, the concerns over safety um, were generally agreed to have been overstated uh, certainly in younger women um, and with, with more modern type preparations of HRT, which I'm sure we're going to talk about in the cases. Um, and that in the NICE guidance, NICE guidance from the UK, which was published in 2015, um, it was quite clearly stated that really symptomatic women should be offered hormone therapy for menopause management um, and that, you know, risk benefit ratio needed to be looked at, but, but generally risks are very small for most women and can be identified. So fast forward, and these next two, next two um, slides are, bear with me if, you, if you're not familiar with, with these data, they're more recent data, but I think it's really important um, for all of us who have an interest in menopause, gynecologists, GPs, endocrinologists, to really understand some of the discrepancies that have been found. So um, this slide um, summarizes results from the collaborative group on hormone factors in breast cancer data that was published in 2019, looking specifically at breast cancer risk with HRT. And this uh, group reanalyzed data from 58 worldwide studies over several years. And they have identified in their, in their data analysis that the risk of breast cancer is definitely greater with combined HRT than unopposed estrogen. So that's nothing new. We know that combined HRT from all the earlier studies seemed to increase risk, um, but uh, in particular, they found that the combined HRT with some preparations were, appeared to be safer than others. So the use of didrogesterone as the progestogen, which is a synthetic progestogen, but it's a more modern generation progestogen, and the use of micronized progesterone, which is a bioidentical to, to our own natural progesterone, uh, which has been available for a, a few years, um, these do not appear to increase risk of breast cancer up to, with up to five years of use. Um, now, uh, the data from this analysis uh, suggested that breast cancer risk 
in women who've been treated for HRT appears to persist for more than 10 years in past users. And I've highlighted that because I'm going, it's at odds with the next slide, which I'm, and then I'm going to decode why it's at odds with the next slide. And um, all of these data pooled suggested that vaginal estrogen, which can be really, really helpful for women who have urogenital symptoms and vulvovaginal atrophy, vaginal estrogen appears extremely safe and doesn't need to be used in combination with progesterone. So that data was published in 2019, and then the latest data from the Women's Health Initiative in America in the United States was published in 2020, looking at breast cancer risk with hormone therapy. Now you'll recall this is a placebo control trial, and so the data that were published last year showed um, uh, 16.9 years of follow-up with those women who were on estrogen only HRT, and that was in the form of conjugated equine estrogens, as I mentioned, the most probably the most synthetic way of giving estrogen um, rather than more natural and bioidentical. Um, and then 18.9 years of follow-up with um, combined conjugated equine estrogens with medroxyprogesterone acetate, once again, very synthetic regimen. And this um, analysis uh, subsequently showed that yes, combined HRT is certainly associated with an increased risk of breast cancer, but actually these data from, from this control trial suggested that past users of combined HRT didn't appear to be at increased risk of, of developing a new breast cancer. <laughs> And this study, which is obviously many years out, 16.9 years out with use of estrogen only HRT, um, was at odds with previous data from the Women's Health Initiative. Previous data had suggested estrogen alone may be associated with a reduced incidence of breast cancer diagnosis. But the latest data suggests there is no reduction um, or increase in breast cancer risk at the follow up of 16.9 years with unopposed estrogen. So I, I hope I'm not confusing you too much because these last two slides with the most recent data show a little bit of discrepancy. So my next slide is hopefully going to decode that for you. So the consistencies in all the results, if we look back over nearly two decades, relate to the estrogen deprivation hypothesis. And it is a hypothesis. It's not proven, but it's, it's a very, very clear explanation. It fits like a glove with, with the findings that we found and the discrepancies we found in the various studies. And that's because when a woman who's had a hysterectomy is commenced on unopposed estrogen, Estrogen in the absence of progesterone results in uh, apoptosis of breast cancer cells. So this may uh, slow the progression of an occult breast cancer, possibly even prevent the, ons the early onset of a, of a breast cancer um, initially. And that would this this east, unopposed estrogen induced apoptosis will result in a much later presentation or delayed presentation of breast cancer. So when estrogen therapy is withdrawn, so in the NIH study and the uh, uh, Women's Health Initiative study, when the estrogen therapy was withdrawn, estrogen induced apoptosis is no longer present, and those patients who perhaps had occult breast cancers or were in an early stage or at risk of breast cancer could then progress to having a, a, an overt, clinically overt breast cancer. So this is widely agreed through all the international menopause societies as a good explanation as to why uh, some of the studies initially suggested that unopposed estrogen reduced risk. It probably does in the short term, but it probably doesn't reduce risk in the longer term. At odds with that, women who are given estrogen with progesterone, so that's all women with an intact uterus, the combination results in proliferation of breast cancer cells because it's the combination of the effects of estrogen plus progesterone. The, the, the estrogen induced apoptosis isn't predominating the progesterone effects on proliferation of breast cancer dominates and there is an earlier diagnosis of breast cancer in women treated with HRT. That may be an earlier diagnosis in somebody who had an occult breast cancer. And it's absolutely not clear. And there's no data that confirms or, or suggests that the HRT is actually inducing a new breast cancer, but it may be uh, manifesting earlier a breast cancer that was in situ or, or at a very occult stage. 
And I think it's important that both these studies um, that have looked at breast cancer from very different angles showed very clearly, and we need to remember this, that the vast majority of women treated with HRT or hormone therapy for menopause do not develop breast cancer. So it's very important for us to be aware of that. There's a big focus on it, but it's, a, it's not a majority. And let's put the risk of breast cancer in perspective. And this is a date. This is some data that was produced by Women's Health Concerns and the British Menopause Society, looking at other risks of HRT. Now I'm going to have to move this because I can't actually see my slide. Here we go. Um, let me move you to the other side. Um, so this is looking at other risk factors for postmenopausal um, breast cancer. And if you look at this slide, um, we've got combined HRT here, and we know that combined HRT from all the studies appears to result in an increased rate of breast cancer diagnoses of about eight to 10 cases per thousand women treated over five years between the ages of 50 and 59. So this is a, this is an, a significant increase, but it is a small increase. And you can see that more than, you know, 990 women will be treated very safely and have all the benefits of HRT, of which there are many in terms of quality of life as well as um, uh, bone protection. Um, unopposed oestrogen, as I said, has different results. This possibly relates to the oestrogen deprivation hypothesis and it's possibly neutral to risk, uh, but we're not still not clear on that. Alcohol excessive alcohol intake which is a problem in the UK uh, I suspect it's probably less of a problem in India but um, alcohol excess increases breast cancer risk as, as much if not more than treatment with HRT over five years and obesity is a big problem I think this is a problem in every country uh, in every western country but obesity certainly increases breast cancer risk as much as HRT, so if a woman is not obese, not drinking excessively, um, and has other beneficial lifestyle factors, so smoking also increases risk a little bit, and lack of exercise increases risk. If you've got a woman who's got no other risk factors, she's probably going to be much safer to take HRT, hormone therapy, than uh, women with lots of risk factors. Okay, so, um, I'm just going to move this again. So let's just talk about vascular risk. So um, in the early studies, you'll recall, I talked about vascular risk uh, with HRT, and this was very much in older women, very, very clearly a risk in women over the age of 60, treated for many years. Um, women with premature ovarian insufficiency should be treated with HRT at least until natural menopause because um, premature menopause is associated with accelerated vascular risk. Um, taking a HRT under the age of 60 does not appear to increase a woman's risk of cardiovascular disease um, and neither does HRT with oestrogen alone. Um, oral oestrogen appears to increase risk of, as we know, venous thromboembolism and possibly a small increased risk of stroke. Um, and it's it's been agreed really by all the um, menopause societies that the presence of um, cardiovascular risk isn't a contraindication to HRT in a woman who needs that treatment for other reasons. But it is, of course, from a clinical acumen perspective for all of us to optimize management of any underlying risk factors, such as hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, obesity. So I mentioned the term body identical hormones. Um, so I'm just going to summarize in case anyone doesn't know what I mean by that. So Body identical or bioidentical is essentially just talking about the natural estrogen and progesterone that we produce in our own body. And these in all of the studies uh, suggest that they have a lower uh, risk in terms of vascular and breast cancer than uh, synthetic hormones. But there's a we talk about um, compounded and uh, regulated bioidentical hormones. So in the UK and America, and I'm not sure if this is also the case in India, the use of compound, uh, compounded bioidentical hormones are said to be tailored to a woman's individual need. And that essentially means it's unregulated and unlicensed and often a very high cost to the individual. So um, all of the international menopause societies do not recommend these. Uh, and they're often made by 
you know, they're often made by and, and, and prescribed by doctors who, who aren't specialist gynecologists or endocrinologists. Regulated bioidentical hormones are good because they're licensed formulations with appropriate quality control and assurance. And they come in the forms of oestrogen gel, patch and spray uh, in, in, for oestrogen. And the only uh, bioidentical progesterone that I'm aware of at the moment is micronized progesterone. Um, and the form we use in the UK is called Eutrogestan. And micronized progesterone is, is has been shown it's 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 been later uh, coming to market because it was notoriously difficult to get in a, an oral formulation it's quite well absorbed through pessary form but not not through oral form so this micronized form allows oral absorption and um it's been late to come uh, become available but it, it's widely available now and it's the optimal progesterone it appears in terms of cardiovascular effects blood pressure venous thromboembolism stroke and breast cancer risk and it appears very safe and it appears not to increase breast cancer risk as i mentioned in a previous slide up to five years uh, but longer term follow-up is needed with this preparation because it's not been as widely used as many of the other preparations um, as, as the progesterone in HRT. So combinations we may talk about this more in questions um, and in, after the cases but essentially unopposed oestrogen can only be used after a hysterectomy um, oestrogen can be used in various different ways, oral, patch, gel and spray. We recently got a new spray formulation uh, licensed in the UK. Um, transdermal oestrogen overall is safer than oral. Um, it doesn't increase thromboembolic risk or stroke risk. So I do favour it um, in women who have any other risk factors um, and who are of natural menopause age. Um, it's sometimes difficult to get good, really good oestrogen levels with transdermal compared with oral. So in younger women, I would more often go for oral, but it just depends on, you know, a woman's preference and what works for them. Progesterone uh, has to be given to every woman with an intact uterus because it has protective and anti-proliferative and secretory effects on the endometrium. So it prevents progression to endometrial cancer, which would occur with unopposed oestrogen and it can be given orally as pessaries and as an intrauterine device or in combination with oestrogen um, in a patch um, and as I mentioned before and I'll say it again these two the, the, the micronized progesterone and didrogesterone are the safest progestogens on the market but um, the data are accumulating on the progesterone um, IUD levonorgestrel which appears to be a really excellent option in younger women as younger women tend to get more dysfunctional bleeding with HRT preparations, particularly in the perimenopause where they can still have some endogenous estrogen production, even though it's erratic. So that's also good to have as a, an option. Um, and of course, there are sequential preparations that must be given um, in women who have an intact uterus who, have, who are perimenopausal or who are within one year from their last menstrual bleed. Um, and essentially, and continuous combined preparations can be given if it's more than one year after uh, the last men menstrual bleed. And certainly in the UK and most of the international menopause societies agree that when a woman is treated with HRT, there is no specific time limit for treatment of that individual. She needs to be monitored. Most women will be able to tail off treatment within five years, but it's an individual decision. And at each time point, the risks and benefits need to be balanced. So let's just go to the benefits of HRT. So it, this, it's a really great treatment for vasomotor symptoms, for mood, for urogenital symptoms, for sexual dysfunction, for disease prevention. It's particularly good for osteoporosis. It has benefits uh, for cardiovascular disease in women with premature ovarian insufficiency, but not for older women. And there's a lot of talk about dementia risk, but actually the data are very equivocal. Uh, some studies suggest dementia risk is reduced with HRT, some suggest it's neutral, and some suggest that it's increased. So going back to Jenny, my case, she had major quality of life issues and her job was at risk. She was only 48. And for women at that age in the UK, that's early for menopause. So, and because she'd had a hysterectomy, she could have a trial of low dose estrogen only transdermal HRT, with, which would be very low in risk. And she experienced significant uh, benefits in terms of her well being with that and managed to get back to work, get her life back on track. So, she was a good news story. 
So now I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about, not talking about HRT, talking about alternatives to HRT and lifestyle. So please do listen, because this is as much important as, as the HRT section. So there was a study published now four years ago um, in the British Medical Journal on non-hormone treatment. So I'm not going to spend too long on this, but please do feel free to have a look at the publication. It's a nice summary. Essentially, there are a number of prescription medications that I will use in my patients who can't have HRT, don't tolerate it or choose not to have it, but have severe symptoms. Uh, Venlafaxine and paroxetine are the antidepressants, the SSRIs with, with good data, particularly in women with breast cancer. Clonidine's been around for years and oxybutynin because of its benefits on uh, lower urinary tract symptoms and sweating, it also has a role. There are lots of natural and herbal remedies that many women do like to try. Uh, really, none of them have a good uh, sort of research data to support uh, them, but some women gain benefit. And as long as there's no risks, there are some risks. So St. John's Wort can interact with other medications, but many have, have small amounts of risk. And it's about an individual decision for, for that woman. Remember, placebo can improve symptoms by up to 50%. So if it's helping, it doesn't really matter how, as long as there's no harm. And then complementary techniques and yoga can be very, very helpful, um, particularly in terms of stress management and stress reducing techniques are very helpful. And I'm going to have a slide on stress later. So uh, remember that there are lots of things we can do to manage stress. And CBT has been proven by research to give symptomatic benefit and relief uh, for menopause symptoms. There was a study published in the UK a couple of years ago on that, and there's more data. It's not widely available, but it's very effective. Um, okay, so um, now I want to do a slide on urogenital symptoms and vulvovaginal atrophy, because many women may not choose to have HRT or can't have HRT, but have very significant uh, vulvovaginal atrophy related symptoms. And there are lots of things that we can do very safely for these symptoms. So, uh, you know, it's important not to ignore them. And this topic is generally a taboo topic. Um, I think throughout the world, it's still very taboo in the UK, although things are gradually changing. So vaginal lubricants and moisturizers, there's a few available in the UK, and I'm not sure what's available in India, but um, these can be very helpful. The moisturizers are longer acting, so will help with general discomfort and symptoms down below. And the lubricants can be really helpful at times of intimacy. But these, these simple non-hormone treatments can reduce vaginal dryness, pain, itching and other symptoms and possibly reduce um, frequency of urinary tract infections. Vaginal estrogen um, is generally deemed very safe um, in the preparations we have in the UK. There is no endometrial thickening that's been identified with vaginal estrogen used without progesterone. Um, and it's very effective in treating vulvovaginal atrophy. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was 2019, vaginal DHEA was licensed in the UK called Prasterone. And I've got some patients who really benefit from that who haven't had a good response to estrogen. So as an endocrinologist, I, I have an interest in bone health. So I can't really uh, do a talk on menopause without mentioning bone. And I'm not gonna spend too long on this. Um, so, Bone loss in menopause really does matter. 20% um, of bone density can be lost in the five to seven years after onset of menopause. So that's really significant. But we also need to be aware that lifestyle factors influence about 20 to 40% of peak bone mass. So if people have poor lifestyle before they hit menopause, they're going to reach uh, fracture risk uh, and, and, and reach a threshold for osteoporosis much sooner than those with healthy lifestyles. And I'm very much a doctor who focuses on uh, lifestyle management because I think it's ignored incorrectly. Um, and I think certainly in the UK, we have a tendency to jump straight into pharmaceutical treatments for lots of things. And I'm not saying they're wrong, but I think we need to not ignore the elephant in the room, which is lifestyle. So HRT definitely significantly improves bone density um, and every study that's ever been done has shown that. Um, nutrition is very important. So uh, in postmenopausal women are recommended to have calcium of 1.2 grams of elemental calcium per day and somewhere between 400 and 1,000 international units a day to optimize their bone health. Um, 
regular weight bearing exercise significantly improves bone health and excessive alcohol and smoking are bad. Um, and it's also important for us as clinicians to identify secondary risk factors for osteoporosis in any woman we see with who's in menopause who might be at greater risk of subsequently developing uh, uh, osteoporosis in those few years after she goes into menopause. So what are those? So the secondary risk factors, um, you know, patients who you have who are who are either hypothyroid with overtreatment with thyroid medication or those who've had Graves disease who've been difficult to control and haven't been cured. So with a suppressed TSH is a, an independent risk factor for osteopenia. Primary hyperparathyroidism, leeches, calcium from the bones, anorexia nervosa, and women who've had that condition, they've had hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism and will have been estrogen deficient for a significant time. Inflammatory bowel disease and celiac disease affect absorption of calcium and vitamin D from the gut and chronic liver and kidney disease will affect uh, activation of vitamin D. So they're all important things to remember when we're assessing any individual for osteoporosis risk and in particular postmenopausal women who have a greater risk than others. And of course, these medications can all increase at risk as well. So taking a medication history uh, and a medical history is important. Right, so a few minutes to talk about, I think I'm doing, I think I'm doing okay time-wise. Um, so we'll have time for, for, for the cases and questions. So I want to spend some time, because I'm very passionate about this, about managing menopause with lifestyle. So we have 60 years of research demonstrating that physical activity significantly reduces uh, long-term risk of, of chronic health issues and reducing early death. If physical activity was a, uh, a pill, it would be a bestseller. It would be a bestseller. The pharmaceutical company producing it would be uh, you know, very wealthy, but it's not. And so we ignore it. And I think it's really important not to ignore it because physical activity after menopause can reduce uh, long-term risk of all of these conditions. Nutrition is also very important. Women going into menopause often gain weight and so they try to restrict calories to try and lose weight. And with that can come a deficiency in micronutrients and unbalanced diets, even when all food groups are, are included, can then be associated with some micronutrient deficiencies. Of course, vegan diets will notoriously have a higher rate of deficiency of B12, iron, iodine, and calcium. But any diet that's restrictive can, can result in deficiencies. And there's a potential impact of micronutrient deficiencies on things like fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, insomnia, and bone loss. And all of these factors are very important Important for women in menopause because these are symptoms that are common, commonly experienced by menopausal women. Sleep is a big problem for most women who go into menopause and we do need to pay attention to menopause related sleep problems such as um, in uh, hot sweats at night and, and flushes. But we also need to remember that it's our modern world and it links in with the first slide I talked about menopause today being different. And what I'm talking about is, is sleep dysfunction beyond HRT. And I'm talking about the fact that we're all, or the majority of us sleeping with the enemy. And that's our, telephone, our phone screens, uh, computer screens, laptops, iPads, devices. The screen time is mentally stimulating. So we're uh, surging our stress hormones at night, which they're not meant to be. So that can in itself induce a bit of insomnia. But the environmentally friendly blue light that shines out of all these screens will delay melatonin release. This is this is hard facts. This is not, you know, this is this is absolute fact. They will increase alertness and they will shift the circadian rhythm by three hours. All the studies on blue light have shown this. So if you're on your phone late at night and you're in menopause, you're asking for trouble. So it's just really important to address those issues and that can help you know, very significantly. And then the stress response, and I mentioned stress. Stress in today's world is much more likely to be relentless compared to previous generations. And our protective mechanisms are not prepared for relentless stress. 
Um, I saw something in the news on in the UK, a campaign talking about us all being on the front line because we've got media streamed to our phones and it's all bad news and it's very stressful. And when stress is imbalanced, we know that it accumulates and causes long term health issues. And this is known scientifically in neuroendocrinology as a phenomenon called allostatic load. And it was first described back in 1993. But there have been many, many studies looking at allostatic load from many centers throughout the world, peer reviewed, good quality studies. And we know that chronic stress leads to physical disease. It leads to impaired immunity, atherosclerosis, obesity, bone demineralization, and cerebral atrophy. And it's a predictor for all cause mortality. So women in menopause are under stress and their other uh, uh, health issues can, can worsen if they're subjected to chronic stress. So stress management in today's world is extremely important and we mustn't forget that. OK, and there's many things we can do to help with stress, but we need to recognize, acknowledge and validate that it's important before we can do anything about it and move forward. So on a positive note, really, to end, hopefully some of you will have heard about the neurokinin 3 receptor antagonist, which is a, a new treatment. It's not available yet, but it is gone going through late uh, clinical studies now. Um, phase two studies were published back in about initially in about 2017, um, initially pioneered by our own UK-based Imperial College London. This is targeting the underlying sweating mechanism, and it appears safe and effective at relieving hot flushes, improving sleep and well-being. The results are astounding and have been re reproduced by other centres in Europe and United States, and they don't affect um, oestrogen levels or FSH levels. So this is going to be a safe treatment for women who can't take HRT. Uh, it appears to be pretty minimal in term or no side effects have really been identified. And it's an oral medication. So watch this space. Hopefully it will be available in the foreseeable future. So to summarize, I hope I haven't overrun. I think I'm just about to time. I hope I've convinced you all that menopause today is different and it, any woman's individual menopause experience it relates to a complex matrix of her own endogenous factors and environmental variables that she's subject to. Menopause hormone therapy should be an individual informed choice for each woman and the balance of pros and cons and risks and benefits needs to be identified for that woman and these can change over time a, a woman who's taking hrt at 48 may not be able to take it as safely when she's 56 or 60. i think all women should be encouraged to implement positive lifestyle measures which will have a positive impact on their quality of life in menopause their well-being, their long-term health, and these lifestyle measures will also reduce chronic disease risk and all-cause mortality. So that, I'll finish there. Um, I'm happy to take questions or we can move straight on to cases. Um, I will just plug my book. I've just released it in the UK. It's available on Amazon. It's available on Kindle as well. So you, that can be downloaded from anywhere, but it will be available in India um, in the near future. Um, so, um, it's aimed at women, but I've got quite a lot, quite a cohort of healthcare professionals, uh, GPs and other doctors who read it and felt it was very helpful. I've got a colleague who works at Christie, uh, Dr. Claire Hyam, who Dr. Kalavalapali will know, and she she's she read it and she said it was really really helpful for her in terms of her management of her help supporting management of her cohort of patients with premature ovarian insufficiency. Um, there's quite a lot of reviews on Amazon, um, so I hope that will persuade you to uh, look at it when it's available to you and recommend it to your patients. Okay, so with that, I think I will stop screen sharing and perhaps we can move to the next section. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mukherjee. I think that was a wonderful roundup of a very difficult topic. And uh, you know your knowledge and your uh, interest and the passion did come through because after writing that book, I'm sure you were into it all the time. Uh, so excellent, and I'm sure the audience who have been here on a Sunday evening uh, definitely would have benefited. Especially you have alluded to all the uh, uh, the more most important adverse effects which goes on not only in the clinician's mind and the uh, woman's mind. 
So I think you've addressed those issues very well. But um, I would like to, you know, uh, uh, make one or two comments on this because we yeah. also have an Indian menopause society, like uh, which is there for the past 25 years. And we have been bringing out some guidelines. We've brought out five guidelines. The fifth one has been released in 2021, 2021. So that runs somewhere around 500 pages now. And mm -hmm. yeah, so, so there were two things, you know, which was a kind of slightly different. I don't know whether we are in the right track. One is, you know, now I think we, we are very clear about the use of the terminology of HRT and MHT. Yeah, yeah. We are sticking only to the physiological changes of menopause and HRT whenever it, when we're referring to POI. So we are very clear, we, you know, we want to promote that concept so that we speak the same language because use of MHT probably would be very different and use of HRT would be very different to a different set of women. This is more physiological that becomes pathological. That is one. And uh, yeah, I was also uh, probably you know, a little surprised that you just talked about uh, menopause and osteoporosis for the prevention. So we would definitely like to hear in the question answer session, what is your take on the treatment in the early postmenopausal period? not in PUI, but in the menopause period, if a woman has not low bone mass, but has osteoporosis, what is the kind of treatment that you would like to give? So that is uh, one take. And the third uh, place where, where I kind of preferred was uh, the post WHI, 11 years, 18 years follow up of post WHI. The estrogen alone still persistently showed the benefit is from what was my understanding is probably we'll just have to go back and look at that. And, uh, and there were some very interesting outcomes of that JAMA study in 2020, which elegantly showed that the increase was actually because there was a decrease in the, uh, those population who were on placebo, but who were earlier on uh, MHT, but they were on placebo and not, in, uh, not an estrogen and progesterone. So there was a decrease. So that, you know, the increase actually was not a real increase, but when you mm -hmm. compare to that increase, it showed an increase. So I'm, yeah. So, that the, so, you know, all these things are too much of statistics, which is very difficult for a, a clinician to understand. But the message is that it really didn't increase. And, you know, the increase with an HHT, because I know the endocrines are also here, so I'm taking the opportunity to put forth this view that MHT uh, initiating, promoting breast cancer is as good as a statin or some of the antihypertensives promoting breast cancer. That's what some of the studies say. So yeah, so wonderful. And I really look forward for the um, uh, case presentations. And uh, yeah, we look, we look forward for your question answer session after the case. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee. And may I invite Dr. Usha? Uh, to, uh, Usha, are you there? Usha, you're not seen on the screen. She's on the screen, but she's muted and no video. Uh, her video is not there and her video is not there and she's muted as well. Uh, no, 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 I'm here. I'm here. I'm just oh, keeping quiet here. whilst I'm very much. <laughs> so, so you can start Thank sharing you. your screen and uh, Excellent. Uh, Dr. Rakesh or Dr. Sham, who's going to introduce Dr. Usha. I'm sure she's well known to the Indian, uh, <laughs> uh, but still as a formality, would you like to introduce Dr. Sham? Are you there? I'm sure Dr. Rakesh. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Usha is very well known to all of us, and uh, she's an endocrinologist who's um, uh, trained in the UK. She's worked and uh, she's been uh, here for the last 10 years in, the, in uh, Chennai, practicing in the city of Chennai. And uh, she's uh, very well, well known in, in, in the endocrine circles in India. And uh, uh, I would uh, request her to go on with the case presentations. Dr. Usha. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction, uh, Dr. Sahai. Um, I've been in India now for about five years, um, although it does seem a lot longer, um, time flies. Um, so I am taking full advantage of the fact that I have an incredible panel in front of me and I have the easiest job on earth. I just need to ask the questions, the questions I have in daily life about HRT and menopause. And if I just put those questions, I'm sure I'll end up learning a lot along with the rest of you. Now, there is no way that I could possibly cover the spectrum of presentations of HRT, sorry, of menopause, because as Dr. Mukherjee has just pointed out to us, it's different for every woman. But what I've done is I've tried to cover three broad scenarios and hopefully over the case, over the run of the cases we'll uh, see the scenarios so case one for me and 
I have to start off with a disclaimer. I mean, no disrespect to any of my colleagues or um, any of my obstetric colleagues, but I think this is the reality of practice in India when you see women it's a disconnect between the perceptions of the women and anything that we may advise uh, medically. And HRT and symptoms around menopause are something that are very taboo and that we as health professionals still struggle to persuade the patients to accept as a valid medical uh, intervention. So this young lady, and there was a spate of cases at the end of December, I suddenly saw four or five women um, and all these cases are from December. When, and then Sham happened to call me and say, well, we're doing this uh, talk on HRT. Would you want to bring a few cases? I said, fantastic. I can bring the five I've seen in the last few weeks. So this is someone I saw in December. She's 40 years old, went through menarche and a couple of pregnancies completely normally. She had her last childbirth at the age of 28. And then over the last eight to nine years, she's developed amenorrhea. She's been seen by a few different uh, obstetricians and gynecologists. So she went back to the gynae who delivered her initially and then shopped around a bit more, as you tend to see in India. And for the first few years, she had withdrawal bleeds with the progesterone a few times in a year. Whenever she went to someone, they'd get three months of progesterone or three cycles of progesterone. And eventually somebody told her, well, you're done with your family, so don't worry about your periods. And then the patient heaved a huge sigh of relief and said, well, good, thank God, I don't need to worry about this monthly hassle anymore. The reason she came to me was that 40, she had an office health check and her A1C was 5.9. So that triggered her visit to me. And then in taking a full medical history, I got this history of menarche and, uh, sorry, amenorrhea and this premature ovarian insufficiency. So when I did her FSH, it was 96.9. So we're into well-established uh, ovarian insufficiency territory. There are no doubts about it. And she's a non-smoker with no personal or family history of anything that triggered any alarms for me. The one thing I wanted to bring out in this is that she has a family history on the men of what I would consider early CVD. But I know that Dr. Anis was uh, talking about CVD and HRT in specific, but these are things that we see in clinic every day. And these cases illustrate the thought process that we need to go through when we make these decisions about the formulations and the combinations of HRT. So this is case one. Then barely two days later, I saw this young lady, just over 40, 40 and five months. She presented for what she said, oh, doc, I haven't seen anyone for a little while for my thyroid, so I thought I'd come in. And again, as part of my medical history, I said, well, how are your cycles doing? She said, they were okay till three years ago, and I'm done with all that. Initially, she was given progesterone for a few uh, months, and then eventually she stopped bleeding with progesterone for withdrawal. And her last menstrual period, now I saw her in December 2020, and her last menstrual period was July 2019. And at that point of time, she just decided, fine, enough is enough. I haven't bled for a couple of months, even after taking progesterone, I'm done with this. Looking back at her history, her first pregnancy in 2011 ended in a miscarriage. And then she said, oh, I had a second pregnancy in 2012, 13, which was an IVF pregnancy. Now this set off a few alarm bells for me. And I said, put aside your thyroid, you're doing well. I need to see your old medical records. So she came back the next time around with her husband. And then the story slowly comes out. In 2012, she was told that she had a very low AMH. And she, I couldn't find the note in her records. Obviously, you know, when she brought them, they were a hodgepodge of various things. But what came out was that she had an IVF pregnancy with a donor egg. Now, they didn't want the family to know this, so it's been kept quiet. And then when she had this amenorrhea, she didn't really seek medical help because she lives with her in-laws in her family. Again, a common situation in India, and they weren't really going to go there. So somebody had seen her in 2018 when they were giving these uh, withdrawal bleed uh, progesterones, and she had an FSH of 54 at that time. And someone had repeated in 2020, which was 85. So I didn't really bother repeating her FSH. There was a slight uh, doubt. Her maternal grandmother had some form of a cancer down below. She wasn't very sure if it was CS cervix or endometrium or whatever it was, but she said she had something down below and she died of that cancer. 
So these are the kind of women where we obviously have, by definition, premature ovarian insufficiency because both of them had um, amenorrhea, secondary amenorrhea with cessation of ovarian function under the age of 40. So I'm now going to put these questions on the screen and actually hand over to our panel. Dr. Sahai, Dr. Mukherjee, um, let me stop sharing the screen. Turn on my video. And we have Dr. Meeta, we, we have Dr. Nilaveni, we have Dr. Mukherjee, and we have Dr. Sahai. So what are our options for HRT in uh, these women with the uh, premature ovarian insufficiency. Um, having gone through the presentation at, uh, just now, would you consider a combined oral contraceptive pill? Would you prefer an estrogen with the micronized cyclical progesterone? And if it's an estrogen, what are the forms of estrogen? Would you prefer oral? Would you go for any other form of estrogen? The reason I'm presenting these cases is, as Dr. Mita pointed mm -hmm. out, Hormone replacement therapy in premature ovarian insufficiency and menopausal hormone replacement, to my mind, are two completely separate entities. And so I'm going to hand over to the panel with these questions. What are your forms? Would you use a combined oral contraceptive pill? If you use separate, what are your forms of estrogen therapy? And how long would you continue? Mm -hmm. Shall I start? Yes, please, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, yeah, okay. You. As you made me stay, I might as well, you might as well make use of me. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, so I totally agree with that. And I think I did say in one of my slides early on that premature ovarian insufficiency is, is absolutely completely different to natural menopause in terms of you know, risks, benefits, etc. So there are there have not been identified any cardiovascular risk associated with treating uh, women with a pr premature ovarian failure with hormone therapy, actually. And I mean, as endocrinologists, we always have quite large cohorts of patients who have various different causes for premature ovarian insufficiency. And I myself worked at Christie Hospital in Manchester for several years where I looked after a, a very large cohort of uh, women who'd had um, uh, premature ovarian insufficiency from various different cancer treatments because it's a cancer hospital so and we would always want to use the safest preparations we don't want to increase any risk for any woman because for example some women who've had cancer treatment if they've had radiotherapy uh, that includes the chest area they may be at an increased risk of breast cancer if they've had a treatment that could increase their risk of cardiovascular disease you know, we don't want to give them any hormones that might increase risk. So it is important to have that history and to see what the cause in detail of the premature ovarian insufficiency is, because it may be different if somebody's had a cancer diagnosis versus an, an unknown cause, just, you know, a, an early menopause from possibly a, um, an autoimmune cause. So I favour particularly because I have worked with patients who've had, um, who, who are cancer survivors, to use micronized progesterone because it appears to be the most natural form of progesterone. Um, and certainly, in, even in older women, doesn't appear to be associated with any increased risk at all, vascular, thromboembolic, or um, uh, breast cancer risk for certainly for the for the duration of the trials that have been done so far um, in terms of type of estrogen and again I think I alluded to this in my talk younger women tend to need they just seem to need higher doses in theory if you're looking at bone protection and cardiovascular protection there are doses of estrogen patch which have which are licensed for bone protection 50 micrograms of, of estradiol in the patches is licensed as the, the, the minimum dose required for bone protection but younger women may benefit to a greater extent with higher doses from a symptom perspective etc so i mean in terms of what hrt i would give the first woman needs combined hormone therapy. She's got a family history of premature ischemic heart disease, and that is in the males, but that she would have accelerated um, risks if she has an early menopause and she's estrogen deficient. So I would definitely give her uh, estrogen. How she has that is, is a personal preference. She may prefer oral estrogen because it's easier in many respects. And if, you know, 
if she has any risk factors for oral estrogen, such as obesity or other risk factors, then she could try transdermal. Um, and I would go for micronized progesterone. And um, the micronized progesterone, it, it, we, I mean, I, I presume it's similar uh, protocols that you use, but with micronized progesterone, if a woman hasn't had a natural bleed for more than a year, we would just give a continuous low dose of 100 milligrams of micronized progesterone. If a woman um, has had irregular periods or you're not sure whether she's full-blown menopause, she can have cyclical uh, progesterone at a slightly higher dose. So that would be my preference. Um, for ease, if she wanted to go on an oral preparation that contained a combination, she could have oral estrogen with, with um, didrogesterone, which comes in a, in, a, in a single tablet. And that's quite easy if you're a young woman with a busy life. So that's what I would do. Um, and I would review her regularly. Um, and you know, she needs to have her risk factors, cardiovascular risk factors and possibly bone health risk factors monitored going forward to make sure that the treatment is doing what we want it to do as well as symptom management. What, what, um, are, what are the other things? Thank you very much, Dr. Mukherjee. So I am going to go to Dr. Meeta for an for a gynecologist point of view. Dr. Meeta, so out of these two women, one accepted therapy and one flat out said, no, thank you whatever the risks. And that was the second um, woman who said uh, no thank you to it. I guess in India, what would you do? And two, um, from both Dr. Sahai and Dr. Mita, it's not a situation that's unusual in my clinic that women tend to have this resistance to suggested um, hormone replacement therapy. And even if you do manage to persuade them, there will always be someone else at some other point who says, oh my goodness, no, you're being given hormones and can we and I've just this week seen someone that I've started on it three months ago and she's now come back to me saying I took a cycle but then my family physician said stop so I'll go to Dr. Meeta first and I'll come back to you then Dr. Sahai if you don't mind yeah uh, uh, thank you Usha I think uh, um, you know uh, well presented cases because those are something which we really commonly see and I must agree you know that uh, the awareness uh, is not so much and the infertility colleagues of mine do agree uh, that you know they treat the treat these women with POI, and once the fertility is controlled, actually they have lost for follow up. You know, so uh, I think our system is such that the follow up is not there, which most of these women need. So that, that is the scenario why these women go, don't get treated once, and the awareness is not there amongst the clinicians as well as the women as the. Uh, advantages of getting treated right? they, they, they don't consider that as a pathological state first so i think for the two the in the amongst the two probably the second lady needs it more because we have put in that little statement that there is a history of cardiovascular disease and uh, so and we have to actually assess a cardiovascular disease um, risk assessment and see if she falls in that high risk category with the family history and uh, the history that she's had, you know, IVF, so we don't know whether she had a PCO or what are the other factors which would increase her risk for cardiovascular disease, then we have to counsel her. I think even when she's refusing that the advantages of taking hormone therapy for her for a period of years is going to increase her lifespan rather than cause a problem and probably address all her issues. So I, we, uh, I mean, that lady would need a lot of time and counseling and probably I would suggest to her that go through, I would give her some, uh, you know, material, I would give her time to take a decision. And then we, I would probably spend time with her for counseling. And then, you know, give her all the options uh, um, you know, with the hormone therapy and, and you know, address her uh, concerns. It's not just the family. Then we would tell her the advantages. We would, you know, the simplest example, one liner that I usually tell these women is, supposing you have diabetes, would you not take treatment? If you have hypothyroid, would you not take treatment? Similarly, if you have uh, uh, premature ovarian insufficiency and there's a no contraindication for the hormone therapy, this is the treatment for you. So I think counseling plays a very important role. So the risk assessment, the counseling, and then after that would be the treatment. So this would be my take as to how you have to counsel this woman. Dr. Sahai? Yeah, I agree with what Dr. Meeta is saying that uh, th there is this hesitancy and, and uh, lack of awareness and we need to spend a little or spend more time with uh, them in terms of uh, counseling them and also explaining them. She's put it very nicely. I think, uh, you know, they're saying that, you know, because this lady also had uh, thyroid, uh, hypothyroidism and, and, and she was taking treatment for that. And she was worried 
complained about that, although she was well controlled and she wanted to come for a regular follow up, but uh, at the same time, she's not worried about estrogen deficiency. So I think uh, that, that, that's the uh, issue, and that's the perspective in which we should put it. And uh, uh, I, I totally agree with what Dr. Mitra has said. No. Which is why the second time round, I invited her back with her husband so that we could have that conversation. Um, it's a work in progress. I'm still working on it right now. And, and so, rightly with the family, with the husband, the counseling. Yeah. So, Professor Neelaveni, I'm going to present yeah. the next case and then I'm going to come to you for the questions. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So, let me just start screen sharing again. Where are we? There we are. So, so this, so now we have the experts you on. Yes, HRT is absolutely essential. And I'm using the term HRT here because this is hormone replacement therapy. I think we would agree that she needs any form of estrogen that's acceptable to her with a micronized uh, progesterone to perhaps initially continuously for, because both these women have been amenorrheic for a period of time um, to start uh, inducing a bleed to keep their uh, uterus healthy. So these next two cases, so this young lady has been seeing me for five years for her diabetes and obesity. She has a BMI of 39, smokes on the weekends, uh, alcohol on the weekends, occasionally about uh, four to six units each day, sometimes a bit more. And uh, three or four years ago, when she was around 44, 45 years of age, she was diagnosed with CA endometrium. She went through the usual therapy and immediately, because this is a sudden withdrawal, so she had a bilateral uh, oophorectomy along with her abdominal hysterectomy, she started experiencing hot flashes and fatigue. We started discussing HRT and her obstetric gynecologist advised, wait until I finish the entire radiotherapy, chemotherapy cycles. Let's look at the six month PET scan, make sure that things are okay. And then you can talk to her about uh, replacement therapy. In the meantime, she had an episode of uh, gastroenteritis with uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. She got a bit dehydrated. She was bed bound for a couple of days and developed a DVT. Um, I think she has enough risk factors from her uh, weight and uh, cancer uh, diagnosis and the diabetes point of view. However, that was treated successfully and that was no longer an issue. The second young lady is 45 at present. She's had a hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy for extensive painful endometriosis. She has no other comorbidities. Now, in the case of this first lady, post DBT treatment, I've been trying to convince her that there are forms of uh, estrogen replacement that we can use that would be safe for her. But there is a firm no from her gynecologist and her uh, oncologist saying you've had a DBT. For this young lady, the argument has been made that, well, she's nearly menopausal. She's 45. So, okay, we've done her oophorectomies, but do we really need to put her on to um, HRT? So for these two young ladies, if they were to accept going on to HRT, what would be their options for well, menopausal or HRT hormone therapy? Uh, considering that they have no uterus, would you go with unopposed estrogen therapy? Would you consider the DVT and aggravated DVT and look for safe forms of HRM estrogen replacement? Or would you say firm no? In the second young lady's case, would you say, well, 45, 46, it's only about two to three years away from natural menopause age in most Indian women. And if you say that, what about her bone health, musculoskeletal health, cardiovascular health? So I'm again going to stop sharing my screen. And could I please ask you to take the question first, and then I'm going to come to everyone else. I think... Uh... Uh, good cases uh, you have presented, uh, Dr. Usha. So uh, I, I'll just uh, come to the second case first, like uh, hysterectomy with no comorbidities. So uh, and uh, almost near uh, near menopause, that age 45 years. 
so definitely we can consider because no background comorbidities for her to uh, uh, in the sense as a contraindication to go for uh, uh, hormone therapy or even menopausal uh, hormone therapy so definitely we should uh, advise and counsel them uh, to go for a uh, both uh, because she doesn't have a she's been hysterectomized so she can go for a unopposed uh, estrogen only in that scenario for the second case this is my take on and coming back to the first case so i think uh, that woman almost she has all the risk factors for the vascular uh, uh, thromboembolism she is diabetic she is obese and she is a smoker and uh, like alcohol intake and she also had carcinoma endometrium like uh, hysterectomized and received radiotherapy and she had uh, dvt also so definitely i think little careful uh, in the sense definitely we cannot we cannot go for a progesterone in her because again uterus is not there so again i think we have to discuss the pros and cons of uh, 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 the 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 unopposed estrogen i and definitely not oral oral preparations we can go for a if necessary we have to go for a transdermal patches transdermal patches where the risk of vascular thromboembolism is uh, definitely uh, minimal or no no risk so this is my take on on the, on the two cases i would like to have the other opinions thank you so much professor nilavini uh, dr mukherji um your take on these cases please Okay, so I agree. Case one, she's not in a great, she's not got a great medical at all. She's now 48. She now 48, had yeah. endometrial yeah. cancer at mm. age 44. This has been an ongoing discussion for four years, mm. but you know, we'll see many more like this. So, so I think that's this? a discussion because it's, it's very fascinating because in the UK, it's very different from in India. We've got the exact opposite problem. Everybody wants hormone therapy in the UK. So it's almost the opposite where we have to say, do you really need it? Because <laughs> not absolutely everybody needs it. So this lady um, has got a lot of risk factors and um sure transdermal um estrogen only hrt would potentially relieve her symptoms um i mean i i think that would be reasonable but also she might might want to it depends on the severity of the symptoms she may want to try one of the alternatives to hrt that i discussed in my presentation obviously we need probably a bit more information to know her current sort of vascular risk and her current bone health because i think if her bones were you know really quite osteoporotic i mean she's not had very good lifestyle and we talk about that affecting bone health i might be more keen to give her estrogen if she isn't osteoporotic and you know she ha hasn't got I mean, she has got risk factors for heart disease, but we might need, we might just want to optimize other treatment for her heart disease risk rather than give HRT. So I think there's a range of things we could do for her. Probably get a bit more information about her bone health and her current. She's osteopenic. She's osteopenic. Oh, she's you said she's dexa. osteopenic, is she? Oh, I didn't right, put it in there, but she's had a DEXA about two oh, okay. years post. Uh, so at, about a year and a half ago, she was osteopenic. So if she's osteopenic, you know, there are other things that she can do other than estrogen. She can take calcium and vitamin D. She can increase her weight bearing exercise. She can attend to her lifestyle, which will reduce her cardiovascular risk long term, could even reverse her diabetes through lifestyle if it's type 2 diabetes. So, you know, in her, given that she's got risk, estrogen might help with symptoms but there are many other things that can be done to reduce her long term risk and if she's osteopenic yeah i think estrogen will improve that um but possibly other lifestyle approach stopping smoking not drinking taking optimal calcium vitamin d weight bearing exercise could also improve her bone health or, and certainly pre prevent any further decline i wouldn't give her um any of the alternative treatments for osteoporosis at this stage such as a bisphosphonate because i would recommend that's delayed uh to a later stage and hopefully she'll not need that but um uh i think it's a i think it's a difficult one and i think all this has to be discussed with the individual woman and take her preference as well um in terms of what we what management professor sahai yeah i think um for the, the for the second case i mean the, uh, which you presented this it's pretty straight forward but for the first case in only uh, i think we need to uh, uh, individualize i mean look at her uh, look at her risk factors the bone health and uh, 
and cardiovascular uh, risk and then and 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 i think we should uh, optimally uh, if we think of i mean if we want to supplement the estrogen then i think the transdermal estrogen is the best uh, alternative available or option available and and uh, uh, of course we need to counsel her and see what her preferences are dr meeta yeah. um i agree that now at 48 um we it's probably moot but back when she was 44 yeah. um we had a lot of pushback in terms of transdermal patches for this young lady so what would your take on it be yeah so usha you want me to answer when she was 44 or when she is 48 um mm-hmm. both <laughs> knowledge is knowledge for me <laughs> no because i i know you put up a really a challenging case uh, and and this is where you know Uh, the entire literature keeps talking about uh, individualization of therapy because no woman is same and no woman has the similar comorbidities now uh, uh, so i'll first you know uh, talk about what we would do at 48 48 probably by now her flushes and and you know the post traumatic trauma of the cancer and the therapy would be probably weaning off and she must be in a better frame of mind and hopefully she has learned a lesson well that endometrial cancer could partly be because of her obesity and her lifestyle and you know that you know could motivate her uh, uh, and like dr mukherjee rightly said and i always say that if we had lifestyle in the form of a pill and that would be magic Yeah. so uh, th- that would be what again counseling you know all these menopausal women first need this counseling and having said that for low bone mass i totally agree with dr mukherjee that estrogen probably in this case even if it's transdermal of course there's no question of oral you're going to offer uh, um, i would offer uh, transdermal even for low bone mass but if low bone mass is the only factor then we would do the risk assessment for bone by doing the frax and understanding whether she is at a high risk for fracture if she is not in a high risk of fracture we are not going to go only by the low bone mass remember that we are not going to do we are not treating t scores so we have to understand that and we would of course enforce the lifestyle management at 44 now i assume that she doesn't have the severe rhizomata flushes we assume that at 44 when you know the flushes were there uh, at that immediate post surgery you know when the uh, comorbidities are there and then she has had a dvt uh, because of this even transdermal we would definitely be a little wary in a real life like scenario the, the books are different because we would definitely be worried because she is not a very compliant kind of a person from the history you know the obesity the drink and uh, the tobacco so all of that everything adds up so we would probably go for the um, alternative ssris and snris and the counseling to tide over doesn't work and if you know understanding the risks and benefits probably a transdermal then that would be my take uh, and, for, uh, and for the second case i would definitely want to commend uh, usha uh, because uh, most of the cases mo- uh, yeah all the cases of endometriosis now there is a lot of information on endometriosis uh, which the gynecologists have about uh, not just limited to the uterus and the ovaries we have the peritoneal endometriosis so we would definitely not like to give an unopposed estrogen uh, we should always any case of endometriosis always add the progesterone so it's a combined therapy on this never give it alone Thank can i you. ask a question not, about that actually yeah yeah there's a because- lot of- Yes, tell me. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about that because what we do with the patients with endometriosis is we give progesterone for the first year, and if the scan is clear at the first year, we would then give estrogen only because obviously estrogen only HRT is safer depending on that woman's age. Do you have a time limit for progesterone? Uh, uh, actually, since post-op, uh, yes, I think that's a very interesting thought uh, where where maybe some uh, you know where some study should be done because we don't have literature. uh supporting any of uh, uh, the, the regime like that that you know first year you give uh, progesterone and then you can do away with the, with the progesterone because most of the literature and these are all not, not, there is no hard fast evidence also in endometriosis it's only the yeah. case reports that we are relying on where we where it is said that we don't give the unopposed estrogen because there are chances of this postmenopausal uh, Uh, endometriosis flaring up and again uh, having the recurrent surgeries or sometimes even uh, uh, carcinoma Uh, so lurking carcinomas if there are i think you can see that i'm using this almost as my mdt to sort out all my patients <laughs> <laughs> so i'm going to start screen sharing okay. again uh, yeah yeah so go ahead <laughs> for my last patient yes sure sure so um i'm going to make the case simple but i'm going to make my questions a little bit 
they are more relevant. So 50-year-old female, irregular menstrual cycles with an increasing interval for the last 12 to 18 months. Um, initial symptoms ongoing now for about 6 to 12 months are predominantly hot flashes and night sweats with sleep disturbance and mood liability because of for these and of course the rest of the menopausal symptoms. Off late, she's been complaining of dyspareunia and vaginal dryness and she's somebody who's very conscious and exercises regularly and she basically came to me and said, Doc, I don't like myself anymore. I'm tired. I'm gaining weight. My waist circumference is going up. Can we discuss? In fact, she's somebody who came to me and said, what can you do for me? So in this kind of an individual, if I say there are no comorbidities, if her vasomotor symptoms are the predominant symptoms, or if her vaginal dyspareunia and dryness is the predominant symptoms, what would your choice of estrogen and route of administration be? And then if I add on comorbidities to her, if I say if she's overweight, obese smoker, if I add on family histories or personal histories of breast, ovary, or endometrium, or a VTE, and if this is, say, three years or more post-menopause, would your treatment differ if the clinical scenario changes? I know that the clinical scenario I'm presenting is a pretty straightforward one. But for that, depending on the predominant symptoms, what would your choice be? And then if I start adding in comorbidities, where would you say are uh, getting too risky considering she's 50? Um, I'll go Dr. Anis, Dr. Sahai, Dr. Nilaveni, and Dr. Meeta. <laughs> Gosh, right. Okay. So we've got several different scenarios for this lady. Um, so each she's... of you can opt to take a scenario if you want to make Shall we do that? <laughs> okay. Um... You want to do the straightforward. She's doing well. She has no comorbidities and she's 50 with vasomotor symptoms as a predominant or vaginal symptoms as a predominant. Yeah, and she's still she's still perimenopausal. She's sorry. Did you mm. say on this the twelve first to scenario, eighteen she's, months? She's not had her amenorrhea, last, right? Okay, and that's why I so, said if if she, if her last known period was three years ago, how would you deal with it? Is also the last question. She's still perimenopausal now. Okay, but so if, I if put she it was, as, yeah. if she was twelve to eighteen months since her last one, she's fifty now, and she's no other comorbidities. So. From a symptom perspective, she's complaining of weight gain and vasomotor symptoms and sleep disturbance. So to be honest, I'd tell her to read my book because that will address <laughs> lots of those symptoms. Um, and she may well just be doing a few different things wrong. You know, her metabolism has changed and she's she's you know she's got her phone at night so she's not sleeping there's lots of things that she can do just from a lifestyle perspective that actually might help her symptoms she doesn't have any other risk factors equally if she says look I'm actually I am doing loads of exercise I'm doing everything that I can she could have HRT hormone therapy but many of the women that I give hormone therapy to at this age in the UK will go on it and then they get side effects with it. They start getting dysfunctional bleeding. They say, I'm getting more weight gain. So it's not, I don't think in, a, you know, when you're looking at natural menopause age woman, it's, it's not always as straightforward as we'd like to think. I think in younger women, it, it can be, it's more straightforward that we want them to have hormone treatment because this it's overwhelming the benefit. Whereas in, in women who are, closer to sort of natural menopause age getting older with no other risk factors I think we underestimate the amount they can do for themselves to help their symptoms if they will pursue that but I think again it's individual so we can talk to her about whether she, I would probably offer her a trial because she's coming to you complaining about symptoms but whether or not she tolerates it is is uncertain I would give her because I prefer to give the most natural formulation. So I'd probably start off with, uh, she says she's gained weight. I don't know what her body mass index is, but I'd probably start off with- Still within the estrogen. normal range. Just still within yeah, the I, normal range, but she's put on a few pounds. Yeah, but I'd, I'd probably still go for transdermal estrogen um, and, you know, ideally uh, micronized progesterone. Um, if she was three years out from her last menstrual period, then she had an earlier menopause, didn't she? I think if, if, if a woman has a natural menopause age of around 51 and, and she's more than five years out, the data is suggesting that you might get an increased rate of this U-shaped curve, the increased rate of cardiovascular risk, as opposed to younger women getting you know, a, a significant improvement in vascular risk. So at 50, if she's three years out, she, I think for symptoms, it would still be okay to give her a trial of hormone treatment if she wanted that. Um, so I don't think where she is at the moment, it would 
it would affect my decision, but I'd still want her to be focusing on lifestyle. I would go over the things that she would need to look at. And, and usually when I do that, women say, oh, actually, I thought I was, you know, I thought my diet was healthy, but often eating things that are going to tend to pile on the calories. And I also, you said no other comorbidities, but I also do check for autoimmune thyroid disease or any other potential mm -hmm. contributor to the symptoms, uh, just to make absolutely sure that there's nothing else going on. So I think that's probably what I would say about that scenario. Dr. Sahai, if she then had a family or personal history of uh, breast, uterus, uh, ovary, or if she were a smoker, uh, then how would uh, that change your decision? If these factors were added on, then I think uh, certainly we would like to uh, emphasize more on the lifestyle changes and see whether she would uh, benefit from those changes. And we would also uh, then assess her cardiovascular risk um, in term, and, and also her bone health and, and address those issues uh, uh, particularly. And also uh, uh, address the issue of if she had more vaginal symptoms, then probably vaginal estrogen would be would not be a concern. I mean, in terms of these, these risk factors would not be worried about that. Yeah. I think uh, 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 the addition of the risk factors would, would change our focus towards uh, assessing her bone health, assessing her cardiovascular risk and yeah. and, and and sort of uh, uh, focusing more on the lifestyle changes rather than yeah. uh, thinking of the uh, uh, estrogen therapy. Dr. Nidhaveni, if her vasomotor symptoms, and the same question to both you and Dr. Meeta, if her vasomotor symptoms predominate or if her vaginal symptoms predominate, would that influence your choice of preparation and route of administration? Yeah, yeah definitely. definitely. Uh, I think she's a uh, perimenopausal, not truly postmenopausal. Uh, uh, she uh, yeah exactly so i think depending on her symptomatology definitely lifestyle factors at every stage we have to address that definitely it doesn't mean like when we are advising any pharmacological or non hormonal therapy so it's a lifestyle should be addressed at every every point of time so along with that so if the vasomotor symptoms are predominating we can go for a, a, a non hormonal therapy like uh, enlafaxine all those things and if uh, uro uh, uro like uh, urogenital atrophy or vaginal atrophy definitely local preparations uh, uh, a kind of lubricants also to some extent help if they have a like as you said like uh, some of the comorbidities or risk factors for the cardiovascular risk factors are there definitely these can be tried in such a woman uh, if no risk factors are there definitely like i think we can we can go for a, a, like as dr ani said like even transdermal with the micro uh, micronized progesterone also is another option option i think we have to uh, like as dr rakesh said like definitely we have to assess the risk factors background risk factors uh, like the cardiovascular health the bone health and uh, the other vascular uh, risk factors that have to be addressed and depending on that we have to take a call whether to go for a along with the lifestyle factors we have to go for a non hormonal treatments uh, uh, like for the addressing the vasomotor symptoms and the uh, vaginal atrophy or like uh, we have to go for a transdermal uh, with the micronized progesterone Actually, Dr. Meeta, I'm going to ask you a question that's come in from the audience. Yeah, yeah. Can she have tibolone with uh, topical estrogens? No, no, we don't combine tibolone with uh, topical estrogens. So we, the audience have uh, asked, can uh, the last case have uh, tibolone? Sorry, Usha, I think uh, yeah. what, what the question probably she must have meant was tibolone for the vasomotor severe symptoms. And yeah. topical estrogens yeah, for the topical, vaginal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she meant it like that. But generally, what we start of unless the vaginal symptoms are really, really bad, now we if we are giving oral therapy, we would like to wait and see whether that's working or not, you know, and and then we give them probably some lubricants uh, for a short period of time. And if the oral is oral therapy is not working, and tibolone probably would work well if she, you know, you didn't mention about the libido except the dyspareunia and vaginal dryness. So probably that would be have been a better choice if the if the problem was also libido. Um, so I, you know, so we wouldn't start off a local therapy when we are doing, when we are giving the oral estrogen, even if they have both the symptoms, we would wait, we would give the um, lubricants for the dyspareunia. I think that should answer the question. Um, I have an audience question for Dr. Mukherjee um, saying, what's your opinion on clonidine for hot flushes? Well, um, in women who are of younger menopausal age, so women under the age of 60, 
it, it's just not generally very well tolerated. Most of my patients get side effects from it. However, um, in I have quite a lot of patients who come to see me who are in their 60s or even 70s with severe sweats and saying, oh, I've had these all, all along and you know, I want you to fix them for me. And th if they've got hypertension, I, I will often try it. And, and somehow older women seem to tolerate it better and it seems to help with the hot flushes. However, I, it wouldn't really be one of my first line in a woman who was you know, really under the age of yeah. 60, unless she could Thank take you. other things. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Sham, I know you've been incredibly intelligent with uh, me in giving me the leeway to do all this. Do I have five more minutes just to do this last slide? Yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, Excellent. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to go do this um, bottom to top. Actually, I'll come back to you, Dr. Mukherjee. I've recently seen a patient literally two days ago who said, I think I'm perimenopausal. I want to really discuss having DHEA or any mm. other form of HRT that you would recommend as a lifestyle choice. These were her words. Mm. She said, I've read about DHEA in post-menopause as a lifestyle uh, edition. What would you recommend? Oh, are you asking me that now? Yes, please. Before, yeah. Oh, she okay, came in about so four days ago, and these were she's, her she's, words. She's probably, were, she's probably got a friend in America because Ameri <laughs> Americans all use it for as a font of youth. So, I mean, <laughs> there's very little you know, data on DHEA systemically, other than um, for pa patients who've got Addison's disease, who are hypoadrenal. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of data on that and, and it can help with sex drive and possibly some quality of life in that group of patients. In America, although I don't think there are any really strong studies, it's used a lot by people in America. And I have patients who just get it from the internet just to see if it helps. <laughs> yes. I'm, not, I'm not sure there's good data. But I am I alluded in my slide, uh, one of my slides, to vaginal DHEA, mm. which is a now a licensed preparation in the UK. And vaginal DHEA specifically um, activates estrogen and testosterone receptors in the vagina. So it can help with vulvovaginal atrophy and potentially improve sex drive. That's how they've marketed it anyway. And I've had some patients who seem to have benefited from it. So I think, you know, it, it, vaginal DHEA is licensed and I think it's, it's um, worth a try if somebody's got urogenital symptoms. Systemic DHEA, I, I'm not aware that there's any strong, robust data to suggest it should be given to, to menopausal women. And I'm um, going to ask you to comment on testosterone in the same breath, if you don't mind, please. Yeah, so there are, there's more data on testosterone. So uh, the, most of the International Menopause Society suggests that if... We, I, I'm sorry, I didn't include that in my, um, in my talk, really. Um, but um, testosterone, transdermal testosterone can be given to women. Um, it, it, it is it's not specifically licensed for women unfortunately there's no licensed preparation in the UK there is one coming from America uh, sorry from Australia um but it's not in the UK so in the UK if a woman has reduced sex drive and perhaps fatigue and loss of motivation um, on HRT already we would give a small dose of transdermal testosterone so we use the preparations that are available in the UK for men um, and we use a fraction of the dose and it has to really be guided by somebody who really knows about dosing because if you overdose with testosterone it's a bit like a teenage boy you can get irritable angry low mood acne pursuits so it can have side effects if the wrong dose is given but in somebody who's experienced with it it can be given to support um other forms of hormone therapy, it can be used alone. Uh, the British Menopause Society do recommend it in certain situations, but it has to be, an ind again, an individualized approach, but usually only with women who have already been given estrogen, because the estrogen will ho hopefully help with those symptoms without the need for testosterone. Thank you. Dr. Mita, in some of our women who are in that sort of 40 to 50 kind of age group, even if we start the hormone replacement, we know that contraception can still be an issue um, and we do need to address it. So could you please uh, enlighten us on that? Uh, uh, yeah, so I think we uh, we have an uh, error, uh, you know, we have a lot of this, uh, like one of the questions. Dr. Mita, I'm not able to hear you properly. Is it just me or is there a... Yeah, uh, can you hear me now? Hello. Yeah, yeah now it's better. Yes. So I was saying that, you know, we do have uh, the LNG preparation, levonorgestrel uh, intrauterine device, 
And I think it's excellent, especially for these perimenopausal women who are in the transition between 42 to 50, if they have the symptoms, and most of them also, some of them, not most, I'm afraid, some of them also come to us with this erratic bleeding and we have to high estrogen levels and uh, they, they present with uh, heavy flow. And this would work for the bleeding as well as for contraception. So I think that's a very good choice. Um, I'm going to skip past the non-hormonal pharmacotherapy because I think we've discussed that in some depth. Um, Professor Sahai, would you please uh, comment on, you know, when we talk in terms of, and it still keeps coming up, that uh, I'm not talking about the women with premature ovarian insufficiency, but in the older uh, women around the perimenopausal age, still we keep coming back to this talk about for prevention of osteoporosis, for cardiac health, for prevention of uh, neurocognition, um, or for preservation of neurocognition, we still keep coming back to this discussion on uh, hormone replacement therapy. Um, would you please uh, take us through that? Well, I think uh, we um, have very good agents for prevention of osteoporosis today, and uh, we don't have to rely only on uh, on MHD for that. And I think uh, we would. Uh, uh, rather um, uh, look at uh, look at the uh, uh, stratifying their risk in terms of their risk of fracture risk and uh, and, and and then decide appropriate therapy and uh, look at the uh, and look at the menopausal symptoms and and treat them accordingly rather than uh, using the estrogen for for uh, for prevention of fractures and uh, i think uh, uh, we don't have i mean although there is there is some um, uh, I, I mean in the sense that there is uh, some uh, as you said there could be a discussion on on uh, preventing dementia but again i think uh, we are uh, not having enough data to say that uh, very yeah. firm right now but i would like to have uh, professor anis views on that i'll come back to dr mukherjee if i may yeah. professor nilaveni can i ask you about duration of treatment and monitoring when do we call it a day I think definitely, like, uh, I'll just add to the uh, Dr. Rakesh comment, uh, like, uh, uh, as far as the bone health, cardiovascular health, and the dementia, so definitely no, as far as prevention of cardiovascular, uh, as well as the dementia, because there is no uh, data <coughs> with respect to the prevention, so definitely for the bone health, prevention, as well as the treatment, and uh, that too, if the uh, age is less than 60 years, and uh, less than 10 years postmenopausal, with the associated vasomotor symptoms, definitely we would like to consider uh, uh, MHD uh, for the managing uh, bone health as well as the take care of the rasomota symptoms, and uh, the the uh, the other thing is uh, uh, basically we have to uh, discuss on the pros and cons with the uh, patient and uh, like uh, coming to the duration. So definitely most of the time, most of the time, I think in the presentation also Dr. Anis mentioned most of the time five years. Five years, most of the time, but uh, I think again, in, in, we have to individualize based on the background risk and all the benefits offered by the uh, MHT uh, in that scenario. I think that most of the time, five years would be enough, but I think uh, we have to individualize if we want to prolong further. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to all the speakers for uh, last comments. I'm going to come to you, Dr. Mukherjee, so that um, you can take Dr. Sahai's question and then. Uh, any last thoughts, please? Um, yeah, so I think it, it is all a very individual situation. So if a woman has marked menopausal symptoms and she has uh, concerns about bone health um, and she's within five years of onset of menopause and she's under the age of 60, I think hormone therapy is a good option. Um, but obviously if she's several years out from natural menopause and she's presenting at that stage with uh, bone fractures, I think it's more difficult to decide on what would be the best treatment because hormone therapy several years after menopause may actually accelerate vascular disease. Yes, it might still improve bone health, but it, you know, it's about balancing what you're trying to achieve. Um, for disease prevention, I think the data are not uh, good for dementia. Um, there isn't conclusive evidence but I think for disease prevention in younger women uh, with premature ovarian insufficiency it's very clear they should be offered uh, hormone therapy um, I think the osteoporosis is more individualized I hope that answers the question yeah. and that's why I said taking away the POI situation um, mm. this uh, um, disease prevention mm. yeah uh, doctor 
Dr. Ramita, any final uh, thoughts? Uh, I would say first I would congratulate you, Usha, for bringing out, uh, you know, uh, such an, ex I mean, so many aspects within such a short time and trying to get the best of it. Thank you. And, yeah, thank you. And lovely uh, presentation. So yeah, my last thoughts are, uh, I would thank IDEA for coming out with this idea of having the cross speciality. You know, we should be having more of the cross speciality. That is where the interaction is much more, like you've shown us where the obstetricians are missing out when they come to us with the POI and we should be following up you know, as predictors, uh, even before they get into a problem, when you have to catch them and when we should be doing cross referrals. See, when we are in a, when we at a scenario when they have pro, uh, comorbidities, it's better to take the help of your colleague. And if you feel some contraception and LNG and a and breast examination and a complete tiny checkup before them on MHT, I think it's good to have a group, a team kind of who work when you treat a menopause uh, woman. It's not like only a single speciality kind of a thing. I mean, that restriction should not be there. The quick referral makes it easy uh, for, for women also to uh, take up the therapy. The counseling gets better when two specialists come together and tell them, yeah, this is the right thing for you. Um, I think, yeah, and I think we should be having definitely more and more of menopause clinics uh, in the future in India. Because POI presents to the obstetric um, gynecologist, not to the endocrinologist usually. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. catchment um, is very important. Professor Nilaveni? Yes. So, uh, if time permits, I, I have a uh, case I actually would like to discuss with Dr. Anis. And uh, 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 it's like about the uh, young woman. For some reason, she's, uh, uh, in the sense, her both ovaries were removed. And uh, she actually, before marriage, one ovary was removed. And uh, she got married and has, one, uh, like, had one child. After the, like, child, again, one another ovary was removed. And uh, uterus is intact. So, and she came in so much of this. Actually, she went to an obstetrician. So, she was prescribed uh, a hormone replacement therapy as a combination pill. But I, I actually... I, her mic she had a migraine so her, mig her migraine got like exacerbated with the use of that so and uh, subsequently she came to me like in so much of depression and uh, like so much of fatigue weakness and uh, she was really almost in tears so uh, asking for help so in such a situation where the um, like exacerbation of the migraine with the with the oral contraceptive or like combined preparations like how should we go about well the oral preparations um, can certainly induce migraine, but in my experience, if women don't tolerate oral preparations or have had migraines with contraceptive pills before and are frightened to take oral HRT, giving it transdermally, I find does not normally exacerbate migraine, or if it does, it's much less so, and then you can use other migraine treatments. So transdermal estrogen and micronized progesterone, I very rarely experience women who, who get exacerbations of migraine. And I actually have a big cohort of women who have migraine, younger women as well, who have migraine spectrum disorder related to their menstrual cycles and then perimenopausal and menopausal women who are frightened to take hormones. And generally I find that improving their overall well-being, and I obviously help them with lifestyle as well, but just giving them a very low dose safe transdermal estrogen uh, she's got a uterus so she, yeah she needs um, progesterone as well um usually that's tolerated very well and optimizing their well-being can stabilize the migraine and if she needs additional treatment for her migraine then that can also be looked at uh, but i wouldn't say it was a contraindication to all hrt it's just the types and different regimens work for different women in, in, in the sense like i just wanted to know anyway transdermal and with micronized progesterone is definitely the best option which we have but if the uh, in the sense a woman is reluctant to go for it uh, uh, in the sense yeah. any other oral preparations like with the uh, least effect on the uh, the migraine part well i think all oral estrogen can do it really um so I, I would generally try not to give oral estrogen. I mean, if she's if it's a hassle of taking a combination of tablet progesterone with transdermal estrogen, we, we do have transdermal patches that you continuous patches that, that they can do. And so they're not taking an additional tablet. The, the, the patches all contain a synthetic progesterone. I mean, at the moment in the UK, the only one that's available is Everell Conti, which is norethisterone with um, estradiol, but um, they are usually still better tolerated than the tablets. I, I would probably try not to give oral estrogen, to be honest. Um, 
and it sounds like she's not going to tolerate that so no and I would target the, the lifestyle and, and managing the migraine because migraine is often stress triggered as well so there could be other factors causing her migraines yeah thank you thank you Thank you very much, thank Dr. You. Mukherjee. Yeah. Um, I would very much like to thank the chairs and Sham for absolutely indulging me in uh, running so far over time. <laughs> I'd like to thank Dr. Mukherjee for indulging me and all of my um, panelists. And I'd like to hand back to Professor Sahai for his final words and as the chair as well. Thanks, thanks, uh, Dr. Usha, for the for the excellent presentation of the cases and bringing out all the important. Uh, uh, aspects about these uh, about menopause uh, during this uh, with these five presentations and uh, I, I think I thank you very much for for uh, the presentations. I thank uh, Professor Anis for uh, joining us today and sparing your time uh, for her excellent presentation uh, and uh, also my co chair I mean co chairs Dr. Mita and Dr. Nidaveni. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, ask Sham to give the final words. Thank you. Uh, it, it's been a very nice uh, learning uh, exercise for us. Uh, I would definitely, we, we are grateful to, for Dr. Mukherjee uh, for sparing our time. And uh, one query for Dr. Usha, where do you get this energy? Is it your Chennai <laughs> waters or Oxford training? I'm not sure. I think when a friend like you asks me, Sham, I can hardly say no and then survive it, right? <laughs> So thank you all, and I think so, we yeah. will we'll close thank the session today. And we are thank all the audience who have come here, uh, who are joining today, for making this program very interactive and lively. And I, I we look forward to having many more programs in future, and we look forward to participation from all the faculty and the and and all the audience who have joined today. Thank you all. Thank you, and good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.